pleased to serve as your judges. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves. My name is Tom Tinder. I'm an attorney from Charleston, West Virginia. My name is Tom Vance. I am a professor at Kansas State University. Looking forward to a great conversation this morning. And I'm Steve Francis, retired professor of political science in the U.S. Naval Academy, and I'm also looking forward to hearing from you. Please introduce yourselves. I'm Jack Honig. I'm Richard Zai. I'm Grace May. And I'm Abby Joyce. Well, we're very glad to have you as well as, uh, as your teacher. Uh, let me read your question. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King said, quote, never in the history of this nation have so many people been arrested for the cause of freedom and human dignity, close quote. What lessons can be learned from the Children's March in Birmingham, Alabama? What is civic engagement and what is its significance in American history? What responsibility, if any, do schools have to promote civic engagement? You may begin. Since before the founders signed the Constitution, American democracy has relied upon the civic life of its citizens. During the Revolutionary War, the homespun movement allowed women to fundraise for the troops, serve as nurses, and band together to boycott British goods. This civic engagement between women of different classes strengthened the idea of a unified front against the British. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, trade unions were important mobilizing tools for civic engagement. Trade unions allowed workers to protest the mistreatment they experienced on the shop floor. Unions such as the Knights of Labor and AFL-CIO helped to organize protests to advocate for better working conditions. Unions' civic engagement helped lead to the creation of minimum wage, child labor, and maximum hour laws. In the late 20th and early 21st centuries, evangelical communities have become extremely civically and politically engaged. Following the relaxation of the doctrine of neutrality, evangelicals began to be more heavily involved in elections and lobbying, while also aiding philanthropic ventures in education. Evangelical civic and political activity has been successful at implementing laws restricting abortions. Tax credits for religious schools have also been enacted, leading to Supreme Court cases such as the current case of Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. From that brief history, it's clear that the civic engagement of ordinary Americans in many forms has regularly expanded and had powerful results on our constitutional democracy. Since our system relies heavily on healthy civic engagement, late 20th and early 21st century declines in civic engagement of all kinds are a serious concern for the health of our polity. The recent decrease in voter turnout coupled with the decline of volunteerism is one of the main indicators of this threat. To counteract this, Families and schools should inspire people to initiate civic engagement at a young age. An article in the International Journal of Developmental Science found that younger volunteerism leads to an increase in sustained community involvement and a higher likelihood of higher education completion. However, there are many obstacles to increasing young people's and everyone's engagement. The loss of trust in the government throughout the mid to late 20th century in the wake of Watergate, Vietnam, and other damaging events is one such obstacle. The First Amendment's Freedom of the Press Clause allowed for uncensored coverage of the war, feeding the public's distrust and disengagement as they saw the worst their government had to offer. In New York Times v. U.S. and New York Times v. Sullivan, the Supreme Court expanded the First Amendment rights of the media. Although this protects the free press that uh, the founders fought for, it has contributed to the declining state of trust in government institutions, leading to a volatile public who is less inclined to participate in civic activities. The Children's March in Birmingham, Alabama marked the first time large-scale civic disobedience was used as a major tool of civic engagement in the United States. The results of the Children's March demonstrate the advantages and disadvantages of this radical form of civic engagement. Local officials and civilians threatened protesters with police dogs, beat them with batons, and arrested hundreds of children participating in the march. This brought Birmingham to the center of the nation's attention, utilizing the media to spread images of violence against peaceful protesters. The terrible harm inflicted on the protesters catalyzed great change in society. The First Amendment right to assembly protected the marchers then and will continue to protect all marchers, protesters now. However, the delicate balance between braving violence, disruptive but peaceful protests, and national recognition allowed the civil rights groups to succeed. The lessons from the Children's March spread as they allowed activists to apply pressure to the government, leading to the passage of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts. 
Other learns, others learn these lessons too, from American Indians to feminists, and now contemporary Americans must carefully decide when and how to use this unconventional form of civic engagement to achieve their political goals. Thank you. We now have some questions for you. Steve? Yes. In what ways does the Constitution either support or thwart civic engagement? In many ways, the Constitution helps to promote civic engagement. When looking at how the government has a, been able to promote the uh, rights of people to join and assemble under Amendment 1's Freedom of Assembly Clause, uh, you can see other parts of the Constitution being used to protect this. In the case of NAACP v. Alabama, the uh, Constitution and the Supreme Court ruled that the NAACP did not have to turn over its membership roles in order to avoid having a chilling effect on membership. Furthermore, the Constitution, as it has been utilized and understood um, the way that Locke presented it with this idea of the right to revolution and if people's rights are being abused, this has been in modern times kind of translated into this idea of civil disobedience, which the Constitution protects using uh, Amendment 1's protections of assembly and protest, and now this idea of a moral and a social change instead of just a radical right to revolution. Additionally, I think the freedom of speech is extremely important nowadays, especially um, in social media and technological uses of a protest. So for example, social media, people can post whatever they want and start movements like the Me Too movement and March for Our Lives, which are two movements created through social media. I also believe that one of the most common forms of civic engagement has been bolstered by the Constitution, voting specifically, especially in Amendments 19, and later on in the 26th Amendment, this right and privilege has been expanded to more people. Does uh, our system of government, our constitution, our laws limit civic engagement in any way? So yes, there are reasonable restrictions that have been put in place. One of the foremost ones is the time, place, and manner requirements that allow people to uh, have their uh, right to protest not necessarily dissolved, but change slightly. For example, in the case of Ward v. Rock Against Racism, you have the complete uh, uh, institution of a sort of reasonable time, place, manner restriction where they weren't allowed to be loud at night. And it's for the most, there have been examples um, throughout the Constitution, but also throughout um, different people's individual access and indiv on a state level, for example, we've already mentioned time, place, manner, and people have to get access to protest. Um, people have to get protest uh, assurances, but also some, many times people have to pay for the overtime of individuals who are going to be monitoring the protests. So this is, is more local state laws. Right, is civil disobedience always justified in our system of government? Well, it is not entirely always justified. Whenever someone has the, uh, the feeling that they are being oppressed, and they are not causing harm to another person or their property, it is considered more reasonable for them to do such. When looking at the uh, actions that were taking place organized under the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, such as the sit-ins and the bus boycotts, while si there was civil disobedience, their uh, civil disobedience didn't actively harm others. I think that any time that any people's rights are being abused, someone should have the ability to go out and to be civilly disobedient. And again, tying back to what Locke believed in the right to a revolution, in modern days that has translated more into this right of civil disobedience. You mentioned voting. Should we have compulsory voting here in the United States like other countries do? Why or why not? So compulsory voting goes against uh, the fundamental right to vote, because when you require people to vote, it takes uh, out a certain effort of choice, because in many cases uh, where uh, compulsory voting is required, there is a sort of lack of democracy that takes place as a result of it. When looking at uh, the struggles of democracy in places that have compulsory voting, such as Turkey or Brazil, you have people who feel uh, really disengaged whenever they're casting their vote and are only doing it to avoid prison time. There have been a number of demonstrations in recent uh, weeks uh, against the quarantine of COVID-19. Do you think those are good examples of civic engagement? 
I actually think that those are, although admirable and protected by the Constitution, are not good examples of civic engagement because with the idea of COVID-19, there's the idea of public health and public safety with social distancing. And by directly violating that, the protesters are putting other people's lives at risk. So I do think that the right to protest should always be protected under the First Amendment. However, you should also have very, very, bear very clearly in mind the right to public health and public safety. I would agree with my colleague here. Uh, there are other examples in history, such as during the Civil War and during other war times, or cases of extreme emergency in the country where people's rights are temporarily limited in order for the public good. If civic engagement and civic education are really important, would you support or oppose lowering the voting age to 16 in local elections? I personally would oppose it, given that there really hasn't been a lot of time for uh, voters to have become really engaged by their school systems. And as such, I would recommend replacing it with early voter registration in schools at the age of 16 sort of getting people to register to vote uh, when they're that age. I disagree with my colleague here. I think there is a valid reason for 16 year olds to be able to vote. Um, a lot of privileges in society are extended to 16 year olds, such as, oh. You could finish. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> And examples. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, such as um, income tax on jobs and driver's licenses. Thank you. Good job. We now have some comments for you, Steve. Yeah, I thought you did a good job. I, I was impressed with your, uh, your grasp of a number of court cases and you had appropriate application of those uh, uh, court uh, you know, cases. Uh, you gave us some historical examples, which we have not heard before. It was a good, broad uh, spread in terms of historical uh, you know, presentations. Your, your time, place, and manner was uh, uh, properly applied. So I thought you did a very good job. Yeah, I would echo those comments and also add that um, I like your, uh, your expansive sort of uh, a definition of civic engagement and that uh, it's not always us protesting against the government, right? It's also us promoting uh, the government. You used uh, examples like uh, of the homespun movement and, and, and so forth. Uh, which I thought was uh, very good. In terms of the question on civil disobedience, probably the best articulation of uh, its justification and use uh, within our system of government is Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. And uh, in that letter, uh, King uh, points out, um, as you did, that uh, not any law it should be subjected or any government action should be subjected to civil disobedience, but only those actions of government or laws that don't square with higher law. Uh, for King, moral law, uh, for others, you know, uh, uh, fundamental rights. Uh, and, and you mentioned uh, some of that in your response. In addition, though, however, King also says, uh, that you, uh, you should have at least attempted uh, to uh, fix or uh, remedy that uh, injustice through the legal system um, uh, before uh, going to, and you use the uh, word extreme, and I think that that's true uh, with regard to civil disobedience. So um, I thought you did a, a fantastic job. You're obviously very so well prepared. I mean, you had so many different examples at the ready. Uh, so uh, your, you and your teacher uh, de deserve lots of credit. You, you did a really gr great job. I thought it was a very uh, well-written presentation. I thought it was very well-reasoned uh, answers. You mentioned things as was mentioned by my colleague, examples and and legal cases and so forth that we had uh, not heard before. Um, overall, I thought you did a very, very good job. Uh, we want to congratulate uh, you uh, and your uh, teacher and, and your, your mentors and so forth, uh, and specifically to highly commend you for the outstanding work that you've done during these extraordinary times. Very best of luck to you.